Hey, my name is Scott Nimrod, and I'm going to be presenting from a developer's perspective. Application development, um, software development, engineering tasks, aka SDET. So, with that said, I'm going to ask you a question, okay? Where do you rate yourself in regards to a professional developer? Okay. Do you consider yourself good? Do you consider yourself professional? Think about the professionals in other industries. Think about dentists, doctors, same thing, I guess. Think about the mechanics at your local car dealership. Dealership, not used car dealership, dealership, right? Think about think about uh, the pilots. Think about factories, you know, and the quality assurance processes that they have, the checklists that they go through. The automation that they leverage. Professionals. They, they maintain records. They scrutinize. They challenge. They continuously poke holes in the subjects to qualify them as, well, industrial grade services, products, right? Do you build industrial grade software? Has your software been thoroughly tested and proven? Translate it. I'm not talking about QA, I'm talking about you. Are you a professional developer? Do you scrutinize your code? As a professional developer, do you have the ability to prove your code works without having to manually launch the entire system and manually test the UI and go through the debugger and stepping through code to realize that, oh, that was not what I expected. Terminate, you know, the runtime, add some more snippets or modify, modify. run the entire application again manually step through all the code and keep doing the same workflow, the same cycle over and over and over. You write programs, right? You're a professional developer, professional programmer. Why are you manually testing your code? If you're a programmer, shouldn't you be writing a program to check your program? Again, are you a professional developer? Okay. I'll leave it alone. But I think it's it's something that we should all ask ourselves and 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 really reflect on who we are and what we do and hold ourselves accountable, not not our employers. Right. Hold, hold ourselves accountable. And uh, do you view your your job as your own personal practice or are you like some people that believe that uh, it's the company that's responsible for teaching you how to be a professional developer? If you work at a delivery company. You work in the IT space, you build some desktop applications or any any internal line of business applications. Is it up to the company to train you, to teach you how to be a professional developer so that you can build software for them? Is it a delivery companies or whatever company you work for, is it their responsibility when their domain is not based on software? Their domain is based on something else. Do you hold them liable for training you to be a professional developer, to, to build software for them? Would you hire somebody to, to fix your sink? 
but you have to train them to fix your sink and then you're going to pay them on your time to fix your sink or do you expect the person that you hire to hold themselves accountable and already have that skill that you don't have to train them for right you don't have to pay to train them and then pay for them to make more mistakes than what is necessary no you don't so why are so many of us doing this now ha okay i'm done venting i'm done ranting now based on you know the that this dissertation that dissertation i just gave uh let's talk about testing so if you do test your code if you do know how to prove your code programmatically then more than likely you probably do that through quote unquote unit tests okay and maybe you think you're you're pretty good right it's uh you 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 write happy path tests you write sad path tests and um you you're in love with the workflow of red green refactor and you always know where you're at in general with the status of your work what you have done and nailed down completed in regards to the business requirements and what you're working on and you know that you didn't inject or you know that there's a low probability relatively speaking that you didn't inject any breaking changes and if you find out that you did even though all your tests are green and you identify that there's an issue there's an anomaly that was introduced as a result of new code or modified code within the system as a professional developer, you, I know you do this. I know you do this. If you can prove that it's business logic, not integration logic, right? But if it's within the, if it's code within the actual core domain, right? Business domain, then you write another test to make sure that it never, ever happens again. And this is, this is beautiful because we don't spin our wheels. We we're professional developers. We spend the majority of our time building, constructing, you know, the Tower of Babel. You know, we spend more time developing and not necessarily debugging. And so that's where we want to strive to be. We want to strive to be professional developers and not professional debuggerers. So. With that said, I would like to share um, a tool that I recently was introduced to that completely flipped my world. You know what I mean? Like it, I'm, I'm still a novice, right? It, I'm still trying to understand the way that this tool works and the ecosystem that this tool belongs to. I'm still trying to understand it, right? But I'll tell you this. What if I told you that there is a tool or a framework, right, that can identify even more anomalies with your code? What if I told you that uh, as a developer, you didn't have to think so hard about the edge cases that could exist within the code that you write. What if there were a tool, a framework, that could serve as an abstraction from the, the unit tests that you write or specific examples, example-based testing, the, the specific scenarios that you, that you write 
to, to check that your code is behaving as expected. What if, what if there was an abstraction over that that can flush out the edge cases? That can challenge your assumptions, and that that's that's pretty much where I, I want to like just focus on is harnessing a tool that will challenge your assumptions about the code that you write. When it challenge when it challenges your assumptions, it'll identify specific inputs within the, the function under test that you're scrutinizing, right? That you put on a platform for it to be poked, prodded, to hope that it, it, it stands up, right? To, to, to be production ready, right? What if you could just run a tool and it will say, hey, this is your assumption. I just threw a hundred thousand, ten thousand, one hundred thousand, ten million inputs at this function based on what this function accepts. And your assumption about this function doing what you think it's supposed to do, I found a, a case where it doesn't do that. And and I I struck the 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 data. I try to extract the signal from all the noise that I use to to basically break the the expectation of this function. And here it is. This is as consolidated as I can make it. Here's the here's the inputs to to the function that that you're testing right now. That that pretty much um, well proves that your assumption is inaccurate. Here it is. I highly recommend that for as long as I took to identify this piece of in, this put this piece of data to serve as an input for your function that I found broke your function. I think that if I took, you know, a couple seconds, 5 seconds, 10 seconds, 30 seconds to identify that specific scenario, I think it's a good idea that you write a unit test or an example-based test to cover that and include it into your regression suite, right? So, so where am I? What am I getting to now, right? What if there were a tool framework that would give you the data that that would serve as edge cases for your system under test? And even though this would take more time compared to your traditional example-based tests where you have specific inputs and a specific output that you test for. What if there were some tests that we can write that says this function that I am testing is going to have certain characteristics, right? Based on this input, that's somewhat abstract, the output will always have these properties, will always have these characteristics. And when that test runs, it provides you cases where that's not true, where your assumption is not valid. And then you have the ability to take action. You get to have a conversation with the business analyst right, the client, peer developers, about what about this specific scenario? Is that covered in our requirements? You know, I just found a, 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 a situation where, or a condition where this doesn't behave as we expected. And what are we supposed to do in, in this scenario? Okay, gives you an opportunity again to write a test that covers that specific scenario and that that unit test is fast right it exposes opportunities to write unit tests that cover edge cases right all right so 
I think I did enough evangelizing. Um, this is called property-based testing. Property-based property -based testing uh, is, is a, a method, a tool, a way of testing where, as I tried to say or articulate earlier, you're not, you're not specifying specific inputs, specific arguments to a function or for a function, and then, and then verifying a specific output based on these specific inputs, right? That's known as example-based testing. You're not, you're not doing that, right? You're still, you're still writing these unit tests, right? You're, you're still writing example-based tests because an example-based test coming from me expresses intent, right? If you have business requirements, map each business requirement. If it's, if it's related to the, the, the business rules, right? If it's business logic, you take the business requirement, write a, write a unit test for it. Take the next business requirement, map that, to a corresponding unit test, right? Intent. Now, with example-based tests, we're complementing the, the intent, right? That stemmed from the business requirements that we map to example-based tests, right? And what we're doing is we're complementing that where we take our intent and then we, we extract an ex uh, an assumption about what that test is primarily targeting. You know, this test is takes these specific inputs and we're verifying this specific output. But in general, abstract thinking, this specific function that we're testing has these properties. That's my assumption. Tool. I'm going to execute you, and I want you to prove me wrong, and I want evidence, right? Run that tool, you know what I'm saying? Within Visual Studio, your, your test explorer, executes all the unit tests, it starts executing the property test, boom, boom, boom. It finds specific scenarios that proves that your assumptions are false, right, if it can. And there are certain uh, parameters that you can pass, or certain arguments that you can pass, expressing how large the, the 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 scenarios should be, right? When I say how large, like say run a hundred tests, or you could say run a thousand tests, or you could say run ten thousand, whatever number you want. If the machine can handle the load, then or has the resources, then you can provide that, right? So let's. Let's look at an example. I'm going to try to make this as simple as possible. Now, I'm reminding you, right? I'm learning about this. I am not the technical authority at all, right? And people let me know that quite often on Stack Overflow. Uh, I'm a novice. But that, that will not stop me from sharing my appreciation for this tool that makes me a better developer. And not to be arrogant, but I think increases the, the, the or establishes that um, I could be an outlier from the rest of the developers that I feel I'm always in competition, right? And so if I could catch bugs faster than the rest of my competition, right, if I can, if I can nail down issues, if I could have conversations about things that the business, the client, the analyst never ever considered, if I could do that faster, I'm worth more, right? If you could do that faster than everybody else, you're more valuable, okay? So let's get into property-based testing. Let me show you an example. I'm going to make this simple, right? Um, so... Let's uh, do, 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 do. let's go to create a test uh, in regards to addition and multiplication. All right, we'll, we'll write some unit tests for a function that we call add. Write a unit test for a function that we call multiply. They're both going to take two arguments, right? 
And then we're going to write a property-based test, right, or a property test with the assumption that multiplying two numbers, when multiplying two numbers, the result will always be greater than adding those same two numbers, okay? So the result from multiplying will always be greater than the result from adding with the same, with the same arguments, right? That's, that's the assumption. So let's check it out. Of course, my battery is running low. So let's start fresh. Now, something I would like to tell you is functional based testing is, I hope I'm recording this. Functional based testing is, I'm sorry, property based testing, think about too many things, um, comes from the, the, the functional realm, okay? Um, supposedly there, there is support, I think, based on certain uh, frameworks that belong to certain, uh, they're more correlated with certain functional programming languages that can uh, deal with tests that rely on state, you know, or object-oriented, um, you know, programming languages. But this is more functional, right? And with functional, I would like to think it's inherently testable, inherently testable. So I'm a, I'm a beginner. There's some things that I might get wrong, and I expect people to correct me. Uh, and that's fine, because that's going to make me worth more, right? The more I know, the more I'm worth. So with that said, let me get on my insecurities. Let's, let's go ahead and create a project. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Library and call it Nimrods. Let's just call it Nimrods. Okay. Now, again, as I said, we're going to create an add function, a multiplication function. We're going to write some, some tests some example-based tests, or what most of us call unit tests, and then we're going to, to challenge our assumptions by writing property tests. So this is uh, F-sharp, okay? And let me call this, I can't spell, arithmetic. I don't know if that's how you spell arithmetic, but... Uh, this is F sharp, right? And F sharp is a functional programming language that's that's part of .NET. It's part of the .NET ecosystem. It's a, again a functional or a functional first language, right? That's that's a popular phrase. And this is a language that I've probably spent the last maybe eight eight months learning um, on my off time. And I'm not gonna lie. I mean, I struggle. In college with discrete mathematics I had to take it twice so like my bias my mind my brain I should say my brain really isn't equipped equipped to, to, to deal with like I don't know mathy stuff if mathy is a <laughs> is an adjective but uh, but I'm certain things are starting to click so let's let's get started we have a module called arithmetic all right you can think of a module as well, a module or a container of code, maybe similar to a namespace, but I think module is more functional related, and I think namespace within uh, .NET is more object related. I could be wrong, I don't know. But let's go ahead and define our functions, right? So let me go ahead and try to put some structure to this. And say let add a, b equals, and then we say a plus b. All right. So we just wrote our first function called add. And let's write another function called multiply. Let multiply a b equal a b. Good. Okay. Hopefully everything files. Everything else. 
Right. Now, let's write some unit tests, okay? <laughs> Example tests, okay? Now, within F sharp, you know, there's still support for, for N unit, X unit. Uh, I prefer using N unit, but also there's a, a library called FS check, right? Or I'm sorry, FS unit, specifically for example based tests. So I'm going to go ahead and, and browse. I'm going to have to charge this, this computer. FS unit. Uh, install that. This is NuGet Manager in .NET. All right, this is how you can basically retrieve libraries that you don't have locally on your machine. Let's go ahead and add in unit. Is it called in unit three? Uh, that's the test adapter. All right, cool. We'll need that too. So install in unit three test adapter. The test adapter enables test discovery for for your test. And you would think the test adapter would probably automatically install in unit, but I'm not confident that it does. In unit is installed. Okay. So what I did was I went to NuGet and I pulled down in unit FS unit and the in unit three test adapter. That should be all I need to write example based tests for the functions that I have. We can validate that by open uh, 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 open in unit and And I didn't get in unit in here, so let's, let's go back. That should just work. Oh no, I didn't want to do three. Ah! Let's go back. Open FS minute and no, what am I doing wrong? Ah, got it. Open in unit dot framework, open FS unit. So these are the these are the namespaces that we're gonna rely on. Yeah, and let's go ahead and write our test. So we can say uh, let we can use backtick marks to basically name our function anything we want. When I say function, in this case, our test function. But you could use these 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 backticks for any function, right? And this this I don't know. It's it, it provides the ability to be more expressive when naming your functions. And in this case, we're naming our test function. So we can say, we, we can say like 99 plus two equals 101, okay? Now within F sharp, if you have a function that doesn't uh, have any parameters, then you basically identify that by saying your unit or specifying a unit as a parameter. And a unit is, I guess, analogous, for lack of a better term, to C sharp or Java's void, right? So there's no parameters in here. So we're using this 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 operator, if I could say that, to, to mean unit. And we're saying let this function that accepts a unit which is accepts nothing equal and then we can start writing our logic in here so we can say 
add 99 to then leverage FS units operator, uh, which wasn't that, that's F sharps operator, but should equal 102. Okay. So this right here, this is this is and this is part of the F sharp programming language. We're piping data or piping a value into another function that's called in this case FS units should. And we can go ahead and test this, but in order for this function to be discovered in Test Explorer, we need to provide an attribute. So we can do in unit has a test attribute, right? And now this test should be discoverable. So we can we can see if it is by running the test in our test explorer over here. Observe this window. And uh, it failed. Why did it, why did it fail? What's 99 plus 2? Oh, 101. Oops. Okay. The and that should pass. Yay, it passes. Great. So we just wrote a unit test to test this add function, right? See this add function, right? Under functions, see this unit test that we wrote. Test, right? Great. So now let's let's test our multiply, all right? And then after we test our multiply and, and we get a happy green pass on that, let's make some assumptions about the relationship between the two functions that we have. And again, I'm, I'm, I'm purposely choosing a, what I think is a simple example in which property-based testing is a tool to validate your assumptions about the characteristics slash properties of the function that you're testing. Okay, and what that's going to do is it's going to flush out, expose um, specific inputs, specific scenarios that you you didn't consider, and then you can leverage that to have discussions with with stakeholders about how to manage or handle this specific scenario, and then you can also write some unit tests that are very quick with with that specific. Um, with those specific inputs in mind that were identified. And so that could be part of your regression suite. So now let's write some property-based tests. Oh, all right, or write a property-based test, property tests, okay? We're gonna say let, we're gonna define the name of our test. Let a uh, multi, multi, oh, you know what? No, forget that. We're going to say a times b is greater than a plus b. All right? I think that's pretty simple. And, but you know what? I'm jumping the gun right now because we never tested our, our multiply function. So let's pretend you didn't see that. Sorry for jumping everywhere. Let's just make sure that, uh, oh yeah, L let's make sure that we 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 have a test for our, our multiply. So let's create our attribute test to make in unit happy, make it discoverable, and we can say 99 times two equals 198. I'm horrible in math, but I think that's it. Right? This function does not accept any uh arguments it has no parameters so we we explicitly say it accepts unit which is nothing and then we can say multiply okay 99 and 2 all right we say should equal 198 all right do i have that right let's let's go ahead and run that Run, 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 go. Okay, and so we have our, our two unit tests that, that 
test the add function and the multiply function that we have. Now, let's go ahead and write our property test on down here. All right. Yo. And we have a times b is greater than a plus b, right? That that's that's my assumption. Because you know, 99 nine plus 2 is greater than or should I say 99 times 2, which is 198, is greater than 99 plus 2, which is 101, right? These are the same arguments, right? And the output, the result of that function is greater from multiplication than it is from addition. So that's a property that I, that I want to write a test for. I want to challenge my assumption. And... What this, what this property test is going to do is if it finds issues with my assumption, it's going to provide me the specific cases where my assumption is false, is, is, is wrong. Okay, So for this, we need to make this test discoverable, but we're going to leverage X unit. Did I include X unit? I don't think I did. So we need to we need to bring in the libraries for X unit and, and the test runner. So we go to manage NuGet. Ah, X unit. X unit. Okay, so that and so that and X unit runner visual studio looks like that is going to be the library or the, the framework that's going to enable visual studios test explorer to discover our property tests um, yeah install that all right so open Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's something else we need to do. We need to introduce FS Check. FS Check is the framework that enables property based testing within F Sharp. So, oh, let's add FS Check. Bring that into our, our project. FS Check that in unit. I like that better. I should install both. I knew you were going to do that. Oh, yeah, yeah, because we're doing X unit. We're not doing N unit for property tests. We're, we're leveraging X unit for our property tests. The combination of FS check and X unit. <sighs> okay, so for our property test, let's, let's import fs check which is the the framework library whatever you want to call it that's required for property based testing and also fs check dot x unit oh okay cool so we have that in here now let's let's go ahead and implement the logic for our property based test to to basically in an attempt to prove that our assumption is correct, that multiplying two numbers is always greater than adding two numbers. So with that said, when, when leveraging property-based based testing, um, you're, you're basically generating. In property-based testing, you, you rely on a generator to generate arbitrary values that will plug in to the function, right? And we keep, we keep pushing or submitting these 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 generated values into the function until n number of, of tests for that function for specific to that property um, you know has has completed or until there's a, a failed test based on a generated value that exposed that there is a flaw with our assumption so let's create our generator let Generator equals. If you notice, our functions that we identified 
our function add, our function multiply, they, they both take ints, right? A is an int, B is an int, int, int. I don't feel like discussing the, the scenarios of floats and doubles and stuff like that because I didn't prepare for that. So we're just assuming that we're working with ints right now. And just, just accept that for right now. Um, so let's create our generator so we can generate these arguments to, to pass to our function. So we can say arbitrary dot generate. And in this case, we can leverage tuples, right? We can take we can leverage a tuple that will be generated. And from that tuple, we can retrieve the, the first and second item as individual int values. Okay. And then to, to actually execute our test, there's a prop dot for all function that for the first input, if we look at it, takes a value, right? That value we're going to actually retrieve from this generator. Okay. So remember, the, the first argument is a value. It says arb arbitrary value type, right? Arb is the name, arbitrary value is the type, right? So we can say arb dot from generator, the generator that we created. And the second is the actual body, which is a function, right? That takes the value as input, which we just created, and it's going to yield uh, a type called testable, which is, well, a generic called testable because it has the apostrophe before the name. So we can do this fun. Remember, it's we were generated a tuple, okay? For that tuple, we're going to extract the values, okay? You know, values like this except it's going to generate arbitrary values. It could be 1,000 and negative 5 or whatever. So, uh, uh, A, B are going to be the, the values that, that we name. And then we're going to say multiply A, B is greater than add A, B. Oh, okay. So this this is the property, the actual property test, right? This is the generator that we created, and we're basically testing this assumption right here. When we multiply a b, it will be greater than adding a b, and by default, by default, it's going to be one hundred tests that that get executed from the framework. In order for this test to be exposed to Test Explorer, we need to create an attribute called property, which is which is defined in the X unit framework. And we can say quiet on success equals true. Okay. Uh-oh, I need to handle that. Quiet on success equals true. Well, quiet on success means for this for this specific property-based test is we don't care about, we don't need the details about all the tests that passed during test execution. We, we don't care about that. So remove that noise, right, and, and only provide us information or details about the tests that fail, all right? So that, that's essentially what it does is it filters out the, if I can say verbosity or the noise from, from the test. And if tests pass, we don't care about it. So don't, don't bother uh, inundating us with information about past tests in regards to details. Just, just give us details about tests that fail. So that's what that specific property 
is about. Why I don't success. Okay. All right. So I, I, I need to plug in my computer. Let's go ahead and let's challenge our assumption with this property-based test. And at the same time, let me find an outlet. Put that in. Ah, okay. Okay. Now, you can go ahead and I hope this thing is still recording. Now we can go ahead and run this. And yay, our property test gets discovered. And yo, this is going to go green, right? And it doesn't go green. It doesn't. So so what happened? Why 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 isn't multiplying the, why isn't the result of, of multiplying two numbers greater than the result of adding two numbers, right? Why is our assumption? Why did our assumption fail when 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 being tested? And we'll find out that when examining the the test explorer and the details behind the failed test, that well negative two and two. Um, doesn't satisfy the, the assumption that we have. All right, so when we multiply negative 2 and 2, I think that's negative 4, right? And when we, so negative 4, okay? And when we add negative 2 and 2, I think that's 0. And, well, okay, so when, when you do the add with these values, it's 0. Is 0 greater than negative 4? Yeah. So adding is actually, in this case, greater than multiply. Okay. Hmm. All right. So maybe, maybe we need to critique my my assumption. Maybe the absolute value of multiplying two numbers will always be greater than adding the same two numbers. Ah, okay. Let, let, let's let's go ahead and do that, you know. So let, let's let's import .NET system and let's say math dot uh, uh, math dot absolute it's the absolute value of this function's output is greater than adding. All right, well, let's, that should work. That, that should resolve our concerns, okay? So when we go ahead and run that, it failed again. Why did it fail? Well, the first time it was negative two and two. But this time it's, it's saying two and two. Why is that? Okay, well, two times two is four. And two plus two is four. So multiplying two times two is equal to adding two plus two, or the addition of two and two. Okay, well, uh, initially, the first time that our assumption was uh, that our assumption failed or was proved wrong, we made an alteration. We we stated the absolute value of multiplying, right? But now two seems to be an exception to the rules. So notice how we're 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 being provided specific cases where our assumption is just not accurate, is wrong, and and and. I want to put emphasis on observing this, observing what the tool has done for us, okay? We can now take this information and we can scrutinize our function and, and make sure that our function accounts 
for, for this type of data, okay? We're taking advantage of the, the machine that we have to generate these, these, these cases for us, right? Instead of us trying to brainstorm and, and do it ourselves, all right? All right, so with that said, let's, let's, let's make an exception and say, all right, with the exception of A and B both being two, our assumption and hold up. So with the exception of A and B both being two, the absolute value of multiplying two numbers should be greater than adding those same two numbers. All right. So let's say uh, let's let's take the result of that generator, which is another generator, and let's say let, let's let's filter that. And say one uh, a b, and say that uh, a is not equal to two, and b is not equal to two. So our generator is going to produce us values and it's going to apply a filter such that those values do not include both of the values being two. And it's going to give us everything else. All right? So our first alteration was saying, oh yeah, the absolute value and our second alteration when testing our assumption is, oh yeah, both values can't be two. Let's go ahead and run this. And surely this should pass now. All right. And again, we're doing property-based testing to test our assumption and to flush out cases where our assumptions are wrong. And the test fails again. Why does this test fail? Because it provided us an example of using or plugging in to the functions that we have, 0 and 7. Okay, so 0 times 7 is 0, and 0 plus 7 is 7. So in this case, addition of 0 and 7 is greater than multiplication of 0 and 7. Well, I guess we, we need to critique our, our criteria for our assumption and add another filter saying, oh, okay, well... Hmm. Uh, gen dot filter. Uh, let's just copy this and say you can't be zero either. Neither one of you can be zero. Great. Let's run it. And surely, that should pass. Pass, 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 pass. Oh, what? Well, it still failed. All right. So now it's saying, yeah, you know what? Your assumption is just not working out. Um, I, found, I found that if we use the input 1 and 7, and we plug that into your multiply and your add function, your assumption is, is it's not validated. All right, well, 1 times 7 is 7, okay? 1 plus 7 is 8. So addition, which resulted in the result of 8, is greater than the multiplication in which the result was 7. Okay, well, darn it. Let's, let's add another filter. Let's uh, do this. And we can say uh, neither one of them can be one. Okay. And yeah, I want things to be in order. So let's, let's have zero, one, two. Zero, one, two. Ah, zero, one, two. See that? That's, that's my OCD taking over. All right, so 
we just added another filter in addition to specifying that the absolute value of multiplication now everything should pass and everything passes okay so this this property based test after we made four alterations first alteration was specifying absolute value second up the second alteration was saying oh yeah by the way neither input can be two and then I wonder if the or works can we say a equals two or B equals two. Uh, that probably doesn't. Uh, let's run that. Oh yeah, and the third alteration was, um, or should I say, fourth alteration was can't be zero. So if we say A can't be two or B can't be two, that's not right, right? Because I mean, they both can't be two. But it passed. So maybe it is right, you know? I thought that both inputs could not be two. But in here, we said, hey, at least one of these inputs can't be two. And when we, when we ran the property test, it passed. Okay, oh, that's weird. Because shouldn't adding... Uh, 8 and 2 be less than multiplying 8 and 2? Uh, yeah, that's interesting. So what what can we do about that? All right, because maybe, maybe I was intelligent enough, or maybe just from experience of doing this exercise, um, know that I don't think this is right. They both have to be 2. But our property tests pass. But really what happened was, our property test only executed a finite number of tests. It, it only ran 100 different scenarios for this function, or 100 different cases for this function um, based on different inputs, right? So by default, a hundred tests, a hundred cases were well, a hundred tests were executed. And it was green. What if we put a thousand? If we put a thousand and we run all, that's green too. Well, maybe, well, maybe I'm right. Because, I mean, if. Uh, Yeah, it doesn't seem like I'm right though. Let's add another zero. All right, we just went from 100 to 1,000. At 1,000, everything still passed. Now we're putting in 10,000. When we execute 10,000, that's green too. We could put 100,000. And. Everything's green. So apparently, we didn't have to do and, we could just do or. And that's good enough for it to pass. And also, if we change this to and, it would still pass. So if you want to see what, what this was 100,000, if you want to see 1 million, right, that's like saying this right here. We can execute 1 million and you can see how long it takes. And of course, because it's 1 million, it's probably going to take a little bit longer. And the longer that it takes, more than likely it means that it hasn't found a, a test that failed yet. Or a case that failed. 
Now, when we did 100,000, it took uh, two seconds. When we do 1 million, it took 25 seconds. Can you say the same thing happens for the, the, the circumstance of A and B both not being one? If we change the and to or and run it, it's building. Now it's getting ready to execute, and that failed. So change it back to and. Let's, let's shave off over there too. So that's pretty much uh, what I wanted to demonstrate is we challenge our assumptions. Uh, specific cases are, are flushed out by the tool that we're using. And we get to have discussions and we get to make alterations to our function to handle those specific cases. Okay. And that's an example of a property based test. All right. I know the syntax might look funky, but this is F sharp. And uh, even though it might look like Egyptian hieroglyphics, like it did for me, and at times still does, <laughs> uh, when, when you get to understand the syntax of it, it you, you, you learn that it enables you to write a lot less code. And arguably, the less code that you have to write means that the less surface area is exposed for bugs to creep up in. Um, so that's it, right? And that's property-based tests. If I can return back to me, I'm back, I'm back to my comfy place. Uh -oh. What I attempted to articulate or demonstrate is how we can leverage property-based testing to, to do the thinking for us, where as human beings, we don't have to we don't have to try to brainstorm out of trillions, billions, thousands, etc, different scenarios, right? where, where the, the, the possibilities are infinite. We, we don't have to do that um, if we take advantage of some of the tools that are out here, right? And that's the importance of opening your mind to, to other paradigms of, of building software, okay? Not everything is object-oriented. I'm sorry, it's not, right? Um, and these tools, when you start leveraging object-oriented concepts and you start having a dependency on state, um, these tools may not work as well as if you would embrace an alternative method of solving problems and thinking functionally and the, 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 the I guess, for lack of a better expression, the, the side effects from that that stems from functional programming, things being inherently testable, I think, um, is is something worth considering. And so when you when you decide to go into uh, an area that's completely foreign, I think that there's lessons that we can learn from it. And at the end, when you harness tools like this it enables you to be a professional developer by embracing machinery to to do the work for you and to basically catch catch bugs before they even occur right um, challenge your assumptions don't let QA do it you do it right and so that's what I wanted to expose. That's what I've been learning on my off time. And as a servant of this industry, it is my obligation to share what I have learned. 
with the development community or developer community, should I say. Now, with that said, I understand that the, the example that I, I showed was simple. For me, it's complicated. I'm, I'm not a math person, but but it was it was relatively simple, right? What 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 I want to drill into your head, what I want to emphasize is the fact that again, leveraging property-based testing will flush out considerations, right? It'll flush out scenarios where you say, oh, those. Does the requirements doc discuss this condition, discuss this scenario? Uh, let me have a conversation with the, with the stakeholder, with the business analyst. So when I did my checkers kata, um, to, to try to like push this, this functional programming paradigm into my head, that's already full, right? I got a big head. Um, <laughs> there's some things that I learned, right? What I learned is that property-based testing is a design tool, okay? Property-based testing can flush out types that you can use in your domain model. So what does that mean? I'm going to be very quick, okay? Very quick. What that means is if I... Pull up my, uh, I thought I made the checkers. What the freak? All right, when I pull up another solution that's supposed to be my, my checkers game that I implemented, this checkers kata, I'm going to show you some examples of some property tests that I wrote. And this was a very important exercise for me. Okay. So let's first. Let's first look at the types, right? And don't look at the last two. Don't look at these. Don't look at these that I'm highlighting. <laughs> all right. Um, look, look at the other types. All right. Let's just oh, cut it. Bam. And so this is my my checkers game. These are the types that have been declared. You know, black and red. Coordinate, right? Coordinate is like you know x coordinate y or x position y position. We represent as a tuple of ints. There is a, a game piece that can either be black or red, and that's also represented as a tuple in which it's black and a coordinate or red and a coordinate translated a black piece with a position, a red piece with a position. We have space. A space is well a position on, well a space on the 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 checkerboard in which it can be occupied with a piece, all right? The piece being red or black, or it could be available, all right? And if it's available, well there's no piece, right? It's available, and well we can we can figure out. We can establish this coordinate and then move a piece to that available coordinate. And then status, if it's black's turn, red's turn, black one, red one. Okay. Now with that said, these are the tests that I wrote. These are the property tests that I wrote. If you're familiar with checkers, Options for soldier can never exceed two. Okay. So you think about it. For for a checker that is not a king that's moving either up or down, it only has two positions if those positions are available that it can move to. Right? It can either move based on the direction if it's going north, it can either move northwest or northeast. And it can only move to a, a space that is connected or that shares an edge, that shares a corner 
with the current position that the checker is in or the current space that the checker is in, right? So this test is, you know, getting the options for a soldier. And when we get the options for a soldier, there, there can never be more than two options, right? A, a checker can't have three different options to move to. It can only go one or two ways, um, one or two positions. But when we ran this test, you know what? The test failed because what we didn't account for was, well, what, what if there, well, let me just show you. Running property-based tests, essentially, oh, where did my, yeah. running property-based tests for, for the options for a checker that's not a king, it exposed that um, my assumption of there being two, two positions or two options available for a checker to move, well, isn't true, right? Based on the arguments that are passed in, there could, it's not true if there's duplicates, right? If there's duplicated coordinates. So if you can, if a checker can move to coordinate, I don't know, three, one, and the, the, the checkerboard is represented by a list of coordinates, in which 3, 1, the coordinate 3, 1 shows up multiple times, guess what? You have more than two, you have more than two um, options because that, that option is duplicated, all right? So this was, that resulted in me basically defining a type saying a response to my options function. So when I call this function called, you know, you know, checker options or options for, it's actually going to return a type in which there can be different case values for that type. Um, it could say it could return a case value saying no duplicates allowed, right? Or it could return succeeded. And the same thing with moving, right? Um, there, there's a test for moving a checker retains element count. And you know what? That's what I thought. I thought that as long as you move a checker from one position to another, then the number of, of checkers on the board is going to persist or the number of positions what does the test actually say the number of yeah positions on the board um, would persist you know um, it, it, it wouldn't change it wouldn't be modified if you if you perform a simple move from a checker from one coordinate to another then that should not affect the number of spaces on a checkerboard for a checker to move to. But when I ran the test, well, I discovered some, some conditions that I didn't really account for. Again, um, if duplicates are on that, if duplicates are are in the, the checkerboard already, like duplicate spaces, then, or duplicated coordinates, then that affects my test and my assumption is false. Also, my assumption is false if the move is not even legal. You can't move from one coordinate to another coordinate that, that doesn't share the same edge or doesn't share the same corner. Like, you can't do that move, right? So that was flushed out as well when, when attempting to move a checker. And also, well, moving a checker to a destination, well, what if that destination doesn't exist? What if that coordinate doesn't exist on, on, on the checkerboard? That was all flushed out um, through the, the property test that I wrote. And so, again, to emphasize, 
the reason why I'm sharing this information is to is to pretty much state that property based tests can can be used as a design tool to identify types within your your domain logic. And of course, if everything is cool, there's there's no duplicates, there's no duplicated coordinates within your checkerboard uh, that that is conveyed as a list that's passed in to your move operation to represent state. Um, if the if the def, if the destination does exist, right, if it's a legal move, then well it succeeded, and then we return an updated state of the checkerboard. So that's what I wanted to share. That's the exercise that I went through, and uh, it was a learning experience. But again, I wanted to share what I've learned with the community and to embrace um, alternative paradigms for for building industrial grade software, right? And I hope you all appreciate it, me sharing um, what I've learned. Again, I'm a novice. There are certain things that I said that I probably didn't say it the best way. Um, or there's more learning on my part that I might have said something that just was wrong. And by all means, provide me that feedback. But I hope you enjoyed um, this presentation. And thank you for um, letting me share this information. All right, take care. My name is Scott Nimrod. And hey, I'm available for hire. I'm a Xamarin developer, WPF developer. S that I have an insatiable hunger for quality. And um, I believe in, in being a professional when building software and not being a professional debugger. That's, that's not what I want to do. So available hire. And uh, thanks for everything. Take care. I'm signing off.